I would like to give you an overview of cannabinoid research. Uh, we have been involved in it for the last uh, 50, 55 years. But allow me to start uh, by a poem by Rainer Maria Rilke, written about 120 years ago. And he said, I live my life in widening circles that reach out across the world. I may not complete the last one, but I give myself to it. Well, it is as if, in some way, he is describing what's going on with the cannabinoids. They started with a small circle and expanded, and the expansion is going on and on and on. When we started work many years ago, there was essentially no interest in cannabinoids, cannabinoid research, the effects of cannabinoids. As a matter of fact, when I asked for a grant, I was told by NIH, when you have something more relevant to the U.S., uh, contact us. Uh, cannabinoids, uh, cannabis is not of interest. It's used sometimes in Mexico, but not in the U.S. Well, that changed quite fast. And today there is a huge, huge interest in cannabis. As a matter of fact, uh, the journal Nature had four reviews, four scientific reviews on uh, this topic. And here is one of them, which I wrote, and it uh, shows uh, the, the, the brain and the cannabis growing out of the brain. Now, why is this change? Uh, why, uh, why has this happened? Well, it seems that uh, uh, cannabinoids or the endogenous cannabinoids, and I'll be talking about them, are involved in a huge amount of diseases. As a matter of fact, two senior scientists at NIH recently wrote a review, and the review says uh, modulating endocannabinoid activity is essentially involved in all human diseases. Well, even if this is 95% correct, then uh, it is something of extreme importance. And I don't know of any other neurotransmitter that we can say that it is involved in uh, so many diseases. Well, I'll be talking uh, about on this topic for a uh, a few moments later, but let's go back and start with uh, uh, three, four thousand years ago, when the Assyrians actually used cannabinoids or used cannabis for those purposes that you, we use them today. They used cannabis to uh, cause what they said, the drug that takes away the mind, which uh, is not such a bad uh, definition actually, for getting high. They used it for some diseases, apparently neurological diseases, and it seems that they used it in some of their uh, religious rites. Well, when we started work on cannabinoids, I was surprised to find out that while morphine uh, had been isolated from opium uh, almost uh, 200 years uh, uh, previously, and uh, cocaine had been isolated from coca leaves uh, during the 19th century, the active compound in cannabis had never been purified or ex uh, extracted and its structure was unknown. So we went ahead and uh, started uh, isolating the compounds present in cannabis and we found about a dozen compounds and only one of these compounds, tetrahydrocannabinol, which uh, uh, we isolated in pure form, I believe, for the first time, uh, turned out to be psychoactive. All the other compounds were of not of major interest at that time, at least. Well, we found out that in uh, Lebanese hashish, which we uh, received from the police and which we uh, used uh, for many years, contains two major constituents, cannabidiol and tetrahydrocannabinol, THC. While THC, as I said, is uh, psychoactive, uh, cannabidiol is not. N it has nothing to do with a uh, well-known uh, cannabis-like activity, but uh, it is a major drug, and many of the diseases that are being treated today with uh, cannabis are uh, uh, actually 
affected by cannabidiol and much less than uh, by THC. So uh, we went ahead looking for the activities of these compounds and one of the first uh, activities we looked at was epilepsy. This was done in collaboration with a group in South America and we looked first in mice and then when we had enough data we went to humans and we found that in a group of 15 patients half of them were placebos didn't get any material and half of them uh, got CBD at high doses those eight patients that got CBD four did not have any attacks or essentially no attacks three had uh, many less attacks and one was not affected at all so unfortunately these results uh, were not picked up by the neurologist for many years and only in the last decade have children with epilepsy being given cannabis with uh, high doses of cannabidiol and a lot of them are being uh, can I say even saved by using uh, uh, this particular type of cannabis. Well another uh, group of diseases that's being uh, affected uh, by cannabidiol is uh, graft versus hose disease. Uh, unfortunately in many cancer diseases uh, well, uh, the, there should be a bone marrow transplant. Now the body doesn't like it. When a bone marrow transplant is done the body uh, attacks the new bone marrow, the new bone marrow attacks the, the body and the patient is sick, at times very sick. Well, but this is a kind of um, uh, autoimmune disease, namely the body attacks something within the body and uh, uh, so a group at one of the hospitals here thought on the basis of other effects which had been seen autoimmune effects of the same type uh, try, they decided to try cannabidiol and they gave cannabidiol to a large number of patients with uh, uh, that were being uh, that had bone marrow transplantation and indeed in many cases they sh they show that these patients do not develop the graft versus hose disease and um, uh, for example here is some here are some of their uh, results a two and four grade is a low grade disease and uh, while about a uh, 50% of patients that do not get cannabidiol have graft versus hose disease in a, a little bit of a mild form. Uh, only a small number, only 12% uh, of those that got cannabidiol were affected. Those that had a very serious graft versus hose disease, uh, which are about 10%, only 5% got the disease. So here we have something of um, a, a, a clinical value of and uh, uh, at the moment this research is going on and it is going on very successfully and I sincerely believe that within a few years uh, cannabidiol will become the central drug the major drug in graft versus hose disease. Now uh, Diabetes type 1, again, is an autoimmune disease, namely the body attacks, for reasons that we do not know, attacks the cells that produce insulin. And uh, this happens uh, particularly in children, it is known as pediatric diabetes, and um, new drugs are definitely needed for that kind of disease. And we tried in mice, unfortunately, only we have not been able to uh, get into humans yet, we found that in mice that have, uh, that all of them di develop diabetes type 1, if we give them cannabidiol, we can reduce the amount, the number of mice that uh, uh, get diabetes type 1 
to about 30 percent. Uh, if you look at the slide, you can see that uh, the cells that produce insulin, and you can see that on the last uh, part of the slide, the percent of the cells that produce insulin uh, and are partially destroyed, uh, the number is huge. 77% of the cells are being attacked and uh, uh, are not intact anymore. Those that got cannabidiol, only uh, 7, 8, 10% got the cells were attacked. So here we have uh, a very promising situation for a uh, disease that uh, is not uh, uh, well treated nowadays. These are some of the diseases that cannabidiol can be used for. But uh, cannabidiol has to be used in a huge number of, uh, uh, a huge amount of material. Uh, in, in another field, in schizophrenia, patients were given seven to 800 milligrams in order to get uh, uh, good results. And as it happens with many other drugs, one has to develop uh, derivatives which are, uh, can be used at uh, lower levels. And indeed, we recently reported that if we take cannabidiol and make a derivative, a derivative in which there is a fluorine atom on the molecule, the level, the amount of material needed is uh, much lower. So I hope that within a few years, we shall have both cannabidiol and fluorocannabidiol uh, on the market against uh, uh, many of the autoimmune diseases and uh, quite a few others. Um, now, for many years after uh, the chemistry uh, of cannabinoids became known, uh, we learned about the biochemistry, the pharmacology, as I mentioned, a few clinical effects. One thing that we didn't know was what is the mechanism of uh, cannabis action, whether it's THC or CBD, but particularly THC. What is the mechanism? It was thought previously that the mechanism is non-specific, whatever that means. Well, non-specific means that we cannot really find any um, well-established mechanism. Well, this is how do one does one look for non-specific mechanism? If we have a, a molecule that can exist in two uh, two types, if you wish, mirror images of each other, a non-specific uh, mode of action, both molecules will act. For a specific mode of action, only one of them will act. Well, we found that indeed only the natural cannabidiol or the natural THC work. The mirror image does not. So we, so we established that there will be some specific mechanism. And indeed, within a few years, Alan Howlett in the US found a receptor. The receptor was found in the brain, and uh, it is uh, widely spread in the brain, probably uh, one of the most, uh, one of the uh, receptors that found in the highest amounts in the brain. But receptors don't exist because there is a plant out there. Receptors exist because uh, animals, we produce compounds that affect these receptors. So uh, we went ahead looking for the compounds in our body, endogenous compounds, which will affect these receptors. And after work uh, for quite a few years with uh, um, uh, colleagues that came from the state and a colleague that came from the Czech state, uh, we found uh, a compound called, which we called an andamide. And um, we found also another compound, which we call, called a 2AG. These compounds are found throughout the body and particularly in the brain and particularly in those areas of the brain, which you can see on the slide, where the receptor is found. And these two compounds have a completely different structure than the natural than the natural plant product, but they are uh, they have the same activity 
more or less, and they also, like the plant product, do not dissolve in water, they dissolve only in lipids, and they act in the same way with one difference. They are formed when needed, they are broken when needed, but uh, the plant material stays for a longer period of time. So there has been a huge, huge amount of work, and I, you, you uh, call this particular uh, research as the second phase of cannabinoid research. The first phase uh, is, is the work on the plant cannabinoids. The second phase is the work on the endogenous cannabinoids. And I will not go into biochemistry, of course, so except for one thing. Why are these compounds, whether it is the plant compound or whether it, these are the compounds that we produce, the endogenous cannabinoids, effective in so many uh, biological uh, uh, things? Why? Or in so many diseases? Well, one thing they do is they regulate uh, the activities of many other uh, neurotransmitters. A nerve is not a string going from one place to another. Nerves in the body are broken down and that's called a synapse. And the synapse is in our body because in this way the body can regulate uh, nerve activity. Now the synapse, uh, there, is a, there are chemicals which move from one side to the synapse to another. These are the neuro uh, uh, compounds that are neurotransmitters. Well, the endogenous cannabinoids regulate the uh, release of these compounds. They sit on the part of the synapse, the post-synapse code. When needed, they move to the pre-synapse and there they activate a re uh, receptor and they affect uh, the production or the release of these neurotransmitters. The bottom line is they endogenous cannabinoids regulate to a large extent what's going on in the brain, what's going on with neurotransmitters. So to make a long story short, the endo endogenous cannabinoid system today is known to have two receptors. The CB1 receptor is the one when uh, stimulated causes uh, uh, the activity, the cannabinoid activity. The second one is a protective uh, uh, is of a protective nature and it has nothing to do with the uh, uh, psychoactivity of cannabis. Then of course there are the two endogenous compounds, anandamide and 2-AG. I uh, talked about them. There are of course the enzymes, those enzymes that form the endogenous compounds and those enzymes that break them down. And by playing with these enzymes we, we can actually enhance the activity, enhance the amount of the endogenous compounds or we can uh, uh, even leave them for a much longer time in the body by um, blocking the enzymes that break them down. And of course there is the THC and cannabidiol. So there is a huge amount of work going on and uh, uh, these compounds are known now to uh, affect, as I said previously, a long list of uh, uh, things that are going on in our body. And if you can look at the uh, list that I have on this slide, it starts with anxiety and blood pressure and uh, the digestive system, etc, etc, etc. And it goes down to stress. And if I have a full list, I'll probably need another two or three slides. Um, now, let me tell you some of the activity of the endogenous compounds. One of the activities of the endogenous compounds is a protective activity, a protective activity in the brain. Uh, together with a colleague of mine, Professor Esti Shohami, we looked at what happens to uh, the brain when uh, it has been slightly damaged, brain of mice. And we found that one of the endogenous compounds, the 2-AG, and it is in the red on the slide you have, the 2-AG goes up about 10 times after even a, a slight damage to the brain. Now, is that because the brain has been damaged and it doesn't do what it should do, 
or is that some kind of a protective mechanism? So we synthesized 2-AG and gave it to mice that had undergone uh, uh, closed head injury. And we found that indeed those mice that received cannabidiol had much less damage in the brain. The damage can be seen in the white part in the slide in the brain. It, the, the damage goes about 50% less. So here we have uh, a typical effect of the endogenous cannabinoids, neuroprotection. And um, we, we and many other groups looked at a, a huge number of effects, but some of them, the effects were not as strong as we expected. For example, on brain injury, there is vasoconstriction of the blood vessels. And endogenous cannabinoids do affect vasoconstriction, and vasoconstriction is part of the damage, but they, but the body seems to act to have something that affects much more that uh, uh, the brain. So we started looking for, maybe we have additional compounds, additional endocannabinoids, and indeed we found that uh, there are compounds that are closely related uh, to the endocannabinoids, uh, but uh, do not act as endocannabinoids, they do not bind to the receptor, they do not have many other activities, but they definitely act on the vasoconstriction. And one compound of this type, as you can see uh, uh, on the slide, it is closely related to the other compound, but it doesn't bind to the receptor. It is formed from a fatty acid bound to an amino acid, amino acid in this case is serine, and this particular compound we see it and uh, it has been accepted as an endocannabinoid-like compound found in the body. And today we know that there is a huge, huge number of compounds of that type, about 120 compounds of that type, and we know very little about the activities of these compounds. For example, uh, uh, in this case, we know in the as oh, I spoke about ARA as arachidonyl serine, it does not bind to the receptor, but its activity can be blocked by an antagonist to the receptor. Very strange, because how can a compound which does not bind to the receptor can be blocked by an antagonist? We don't know why this happens. But on the other hand, that's what it does. So there is something that we have to look at. In a completely different area, bone remodeling. We were surprised to see that uh, osteoporosis uh, can be affected by compounds of this type. This has a long history. It is known in the Middle East uh, that there is less osteoporosis than in Northern Europe. And it, ha it is believed that this happens because uh, uh, people uh, in the Middle East uh, use more olive oil than others. So we looked at uh, the presence of compounds of this type in olive oil and we didn't find anything. But then we decided maybe, maybe one of the constituents of olive oil, in this case a compound called oleic acid, uh, is metabolized in the body to a compound that's very active. And so we prepared a few more, uh, metabolites, uh, com new compounds, and uh, yes, we found that the compound closely related to anandamide, and you can see in the slide the, the structure of anandamide and the structure of this uh, uh, metabolite of oleic acid, oleyl serine, which does not bind to the receptor, does not cause the effects of anandamide, but is a very potent anti osteoporotic uh, uh, compound. If we have mice and we cause osteoporosis in mice and there are ways of doing it and the uh, bones uh, are uh, affected and you can see in the middle the red is the affected bones if we start giving these mice this particular uh, cannabinoid like compound formed in the body formed in the bones we can see that the bones start recovering they are start regrowing ahead so here we have a huge 
number of uh, biological, physiological effects that have to be looked at because we know, as I've mentioned previously, that there are almost 120 compounds of this type. And we have looked at these two, and uh, there are some many others that uh, have to be evaluated. So let me try to summarize what I have been talking about. Uh, first, uh, the endocannabinoids are involved in a huge number of uh, biological effects and we can expect to have a, to see many others as uh, many many groups are working in the field. We know that cannabidiol is an important compound although it doesn't cause the uh, uh, well-known effects of uh, uh, cannabis and uh, there is the third group of compounds that people are just looking into now and these are anandamide-like compounds which are like anandamide formed from a fatty acid bound to an amino acid or a derivative of amino acid and these compounds seem to be uh, effective in a huge number of uh, physiological processes and uh, I sincerely hope that within the next three years we shall see drugs particularly of this third type of endocannabinoid like compounds and of compounds that act specifically on the CB2 system which has no uh, 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 marijuana like effects. Uh, I would like to thank many of my collaborators. This is a list of some of my collaborators in Israel. Some of them are my students, some of them are colleagues in departments and I want to uh, say thanks to many other colleagues abroad. Uh, you can see on the slide uh, some of my collaborators abroad uh, and uh, you can see that uh, they stretch from the UK in Aberdeen, my good friend Pertwee, through uh, the Czech state and uh, Greece and Richmond uh, in the US and uh, 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 even Siberia. I visited all these places except Siberia. It's too cold for me. Thank you.